Okay, so welcome to the final lecture for Anatomy 1105A. This is going to close out our work on respiration. So upload date for this is going to be December 3rd, 2020. Uh, so today we're just finishing off again looking at respiration. In particular, we're going to focus on control over respiration. Uh, so just a few more learning objectives to cover here. So readings are indicated here with some important figures and also one of the web resources as well. So as usual, we're going to start off with a little bit of review. So last time we were talking about uh, how oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported in the blood. Oxygen, we saw that most of this oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, a little bit dissolved. You also have some dissolved uh, carbon dioxide. It's more than we, we have for oxygen. Uh, some carbon dioxide can interact with hemoglobin as well, um, but most of it is in its dissociated form as the bicarbonate ion. Now, uh, just as a review as well, we know that oxygen and carbon dioxide interact with different parts of this molecule here. So the oxygen is going to interact with iron-bound heme, and the carbon dioxide is interacting directly with the protein part, the amino acids of the heme tetramer. So a tetramer means four subunits. Uh, so we also talked about why so much carbon dioxide is converted to bicarbonate. And so as a matter of review, we saw that carbon dioxide can make its way into cells. Carbonic anhydrase will combine it with a water to form a carbonic acid. This can dissociate. When it dissociates, it makes the bicarbonate ion. Uh, we're going to shift this out of the cell and bring in chloride in what's called the chloride shift. And that's how we end up with so much bicarbonate that is, is stored within the... Uh, within the blood plasma, okay? And so the other end of the lungs, this process is gonna happen in reverse. And that's because this enzyme can work in both ways. And so that's a common feature of a lot of different enzymes. Uh, so one of the features uh, that we talked about a little bit last time is that uh, because you produce this bicarbonate ion uh, and because you're producing hydrogen ions, uh, increases in CO2 will result in a drop in pH. And so you're having more hydrogen ions being produced. Where's that coming from? It's coming from here, okay? So bicarbonate ion, hydrogen ion, you're having more hydrogen ions being produced, and so you're gonna have a drop in pH. Low pH means high number of hydrogen ions, okay? Um, and so we also talked about how if you do rapid deep breathing, this can actually cause a decrease in CO2 in the blood. So this is getting more CO2 out of your system. This helps ventilation and this can give a rise in pH. And so we talked then about how respiration and ventilation and the bicarbonate ion, all this is part of a pH control system <clears throat> for the blood. Okay. Um, I also mentioned before that uh, despite the fact that you're able to, to vary the pH, it's really only occurring at a very narrow range, okay? So you're really working in this area here, which is a normal range. Under most circumstances, you're not going down to super low, which we would call acidosis, or super high, um, that we would call alkalosis, so too alkaline. But the point here is that carbon dioxide is an important regulatory factor in uh, regulating the pH of the blood. <clears throat> so now we're going to jump over to neural controls for respiration, and uh, this is going to ring some bells, I think, because uh, a lot of the concepts that we're going to talk about are similar to the concepts that we covered when we were talking about regulation of the heart and regulation of the blood vessels. And so neural controls exist in this area we've talked about before, so the medulla and the pons. Um, and so... Uh, you have what are called these respiratory centers. So there's basically two different clusters of neurons. You have uh, the dorsal respiratory group, the ventral respiratory group, and then you have a, a group here in uh, called the pons. And so we'll focus on each of these in turn and learn what they do. And so again, uh, recall that the medulla is an active area of regulation. So this is also in the same area as these cardiovascular centers. And so you can imagine that, although we won't go into it in detail, you can imagine that there might be communication between these different areas. Uh, so the ventral respiratory group. The ventral respiratory group, uh, we're talking about, uh, uh, well, there's only one shown in this diagram. Uh, there's two shown here. So this one would be the ventral respiratory group. Um, and so the ventral respiratory group, this is what is responsible for setting the, the pace 
of, uh, of ventilation. Um, so this is setting what we call upnia. This is normal respiratory rate and rhythm. And this is going to be between 12 and 15 breaths per minute. So if you sit there and you, you time how many breaths you take in a single minute, it's probably going to be around that level. The basic idea here is that you have neurons which are going to be exciting the diaphragm and those intercostal muscles. We talked about that quite a bit. It's the contraction of these things that's going to expand the, the size of the lungs. When you expand the size of the lungs, you're going to have a, uh, an increase in volume and a decrease in pressure. When that occurs, you're going to get air that is flowing into the lungs, okay? And that's going to have your oxygen, and, and that's the kind of the, the basis for that ventilation. Uh, you also have um, uh, expiratory neur neurons, so things uh, inhibit, so things that are regulating breathing out, and these are going to act in this ventral respiratory group to inhibit the ones that are dealing with this. Okay, so two different types of regulations at play here. So uh, the depth of the the breath is determined by how actively the respiratory center is stimulating those respiratory muscles. Again, which respiratory muscles are we talking about? We're talking specifically about the diaphragm and under normal circumstances, the, the external intercostal muscles. Um, and so these are, are, are controlled by what we call the phrenic nerve and then also the intercostal nerves. Um, okay, and so this is how we have this, this regulation here. Um, and so if the depth is determined by, by um, kind of how often it is reg regulated, uh, uh, the rate is of, of inspiration is determined by how long it's active. Okay, So it depends on both the, the duration and the frequency of signals coming from this ventral respiratory group. And again, we're talking about this one right here. And so, of course, the key here is that both of these, both rate and depth of breathing, so depth is going to be, you know, breathing in like this, and rate is going how fast you're going, so like this. And both of these are going to be changed by, by various changes in, in body demand that you might have. So all this is happening in that ventral respiratory group, okay? So ventral because it's up close uh, at, the, uh, at the front of the medulla here. You also have this dorsal respiratory group. And so this is a, a, a network of neurons that's located very close to that ventral respiratory group. Uh, and this thing is, is integrating input from stretch receptors uh, around your body. So in the diaphragm, in the external intercostal mu muscles, and it's sending information along to that ventral respiratory group. So this one's, you know, a situation where we actually don't know too much about this group of neurons. We know it exists. We know it plays some level in regulating the ventral respiratory group, but there's a lot of open questions here, so more questions than answers. You also have what's called the pontine respiratory centers. So these are the ones up here in the pons. Okay, so this area is called the pons. This is the medulla oblongata. So the medulla oblongata is where you also have those cardiac regulation centers. Uh, so the, the point of the respiratory centers in, in the pons, this is to kind of smooth out your breathing. Um, and so uh, this might help you uh, breathe during uh, uh, sleep, during exercise, uh, during speech. Okay, so as I'm talking right now, my pontine respiratory center is sending signals down to both the uh, ventral respiratory group and probably the dorsal respiratory group, although again, we don't know too much about that dorsal res respiratory group. And these are integrating those signals to help control that basic rate of inhalation and exhalation. And so if you have le lesions in this region, so this is the pontine respiratory section, still talking about this area here, uh, this can lead to what we call apneustic breathing. And so this is really long and prolonged inspirations. Okay, so, so obviously an important defect in that scenario in terms of ventilation. Uh, so, so what generates this respiratory rhythm? Um, so this is something that's not fully understood. What we mean here is this is kind of the respiratory rhythm would be analogous to the pacemaker rhythm that's in the heart. We know quite a lot about the pacemaker rhythm in the heart. For the respiratory system, um, it's basically all conjecture. 
okay? We, we don't know what is setting that basic rhythm or how all of that works. Maybe it's one of you guys one day that's going to figure it out. Okay, uh, control of respiration. We think about controlling of respiration by occurring uh, with three different things. So it can be chemicals, and we've talked about this a little bit previously, higher brain centers, so things that are happening above the pons, above the medulla, and also reflexes. As usual, we're going to look at these one at a time. Uh, so chemical factors. Uh, these are, are really kind of the most important factors in determining what we refer to as rate and depth of, of respiration. And so changing levels of uh, CO2, oxygen, and pH are the most important. And of those, carbon dioxide is probably the most important. And so the idea is that you have chemoreceptors. What is a chemoreceptor? This is something that is sensing chemicals. So you have different receptors throughout your body that are sensing carbon dioxide, oxygen, and pH. And so you have central chemoreceptors, central, central nervous system located throughout the brain stem. Okay, so in these regions, you also have peripheral chemoreceptors. So these are in the aortic arch and the carotid arteries. So we've mentioned these structures before being involved in regulation of, uh, of heart rate and in uh, blood pressure regulation. And so you can see that a lot of the regulatory factors are concentrated in the same areas of the body. So as I mentioned, carbon dioxide is actually the most important regulator here. And the idea is that um, when pH, or sorry, when carbon dioxide levels are going to rise, which are called which is called hypercapnia, um, you have increased CO2 levels in the brain, and eventually, as we saw previously, this is going to become carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is going to uh, release hydrogen ion as it's being formed. Okay, so remember, you have a hydrogen ion and the carbonic, um, the uh, bicarbonate ion, which is formed. So one of those is the hydrogen ion. Hydrogen ion accumulation leads to a drop, more acidic, in the pH. So in this scenario, what's going to happen is that you're going to have this increased concentration of hydrogen ions. You're going to have uh, uh, the central chemoreceptors. So those are the ones in the brain. And this is going to signal to those respiratory centers, the ventral, the dorsal, that we talked about. And basically what this is going to do, this is going to tell the body to increase the rate and the depth of your breathing. Now, what is this going to accomplish? As you breathe more deeply, as you breathe faster, so slow, consistently faster breaths, this is going to, to increase ventilation. And the purpose here is to get out more of this carbon dioxide. So the point here is that as you get out more carbon dioxide, you're going to also push out more of those hydrogen ions. As you push out more of those hydrogen ions, you're going to be able to balance your pH. In this case, it's going to result in an increase in pH. So again, this is how the body can deal with pH and how carbon dioxide serves as a regulator of, of ventilation control. Uh, so you can do, go too far in the other direction as well. So um, there's something called uh, uh, hyperventilation. I'm sure you've all experienced this to some degree. Um, this is something that can be caused by anxiety attacks, for example. And basically, this is where uh, you don't have enough CO2 in your system. Um, and eventually, this will actually lead to vasoconstriction, uh, which can result in dizziness. You might feel some tingling and muscle spasms throughout your body as well. And the idea here, and you've probably seen this before, is, is to breathe into a paper bag. So hyperventilation is actually all about, uh, about carbon dioxide. It's less about oxygen. And the point here is that you have less carbon dioxide. And so pH is going to be, uh, if you have less uh, carbon dioxide, you're going to, um, uh, your, your, your pH is not going to be regulated properly. Okay. And so as you get more carbon dioxide, um, as you want to get more carbon dioxide into your system, breathing into this bag helps to, helps to do that. Okay. Um, so again, you're going to have increased partial pressures within that bag. It's going to result in retention of more carbon dioxide. And in this case, you're going to have a lowering of your pH. So hyperventilation is basically when you have a pH which is too high. And what happens in response to that pH being too high is your blood vessels are going to constrict. That's what's causing the, dizzy, the dizziness in this scenario. Okay. And so the, the, 
what you're going to want to do is reverse this, push things in the other direction, and basically get more CO2 into your system. More CO2 is going to result in a decrease in pH. Okay, More CO2 also means more bicarbonate, which also means more hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions are going to push pH in the other direction. As we push pH in the other direction, blood vessels are going to relax again, okay? And then the blood is going to get back to your, to your head. That should relieve the dizziness and, and any of these other symptoms as well. Uh, and so this is, is kind of a summary of what I've just said here. And so if you have, you know, CO2, again, one of the most important regulators of ventilation, and it's really kind of all connected to these different chemoreceptors. So you have the central chemoreceptors, and you also have uh, peripheral chemoreceptors. Uh, if you, you have too much CO2 in your system, you're going to have a decreased pH. Decreased pH means too many hydrogen ions. So what do you want to do in that scenario? You want to get those hydrogen ions out of there. You get them out of there by getting rid of the carbon dioxide. So you get an increase in ventilation. And in this case, you'll have the, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and your pH, which is being returned to normal. So that's uh, that's carbon dioxide. What about oxygen? So um, again, this can be sensed by, by chemoreceptors. Uh, mostly in this scenario, you have uh, chemoreceptors being used in your aortic and your carotid bo uh, uh, bodies. So these are the same ones down in these regions here that we talked about uh, sensing carbon dioxide, also up here in the carotid arteries. So again, your carotid arteries are going to be here. Um, and so, so you can sense changes in oxygen levels, but normally oxygen partial pressure has to change really, really dramatically to be affecting this signaling circuit. Okay, you need to drop below 60 millimeters mercury. And if you go back to these graphs where we have these kind of sigmoidal shapes, that's something that under normal cir circumstances, you're really not going to have happening. Okay, And so, so um, one of the reasons here is that normally you've got this huge reservoir of oxygen, which is bound to hemoglobin. And we talked about this as being referred to as the venous reserve. Okay. Um, however, when uh, this system can be activated, when you fall below this 60 millimeters mercury, uh, your chemoreceptors can be activated. Uh, they'll sig signal up to those uh, systems in the uh, dorsal and ventral respiratory groups to increase ventilation to get more oxygen. Again, normally this circuit is controlled by carbon dioxide. Oxygen is only coming into play when there's a very dramatic change in oxygen levels. Carbon dioxide, um, also pH, much more sensitive. Okay, so I said pH is, is much more sensitive. Uh, so pH can be uh, important and it can be sensed even if oxygen and carbon dioxide levels are normal. Uh, and so you might get, uh, you know, pH can be affected by carbon dioxide. However, you can also get an increase or decrease pH based on the levels of lactic acid or these things called ketone bodies, which you'll learn about in other courses. Um, and so again, the, the goal in kind of uh, controlling respiration in response to pH, it all works through carbon dioxide. Respiratory system is going to raise pH by increasing both the depth and the rate of respiration. Okay, and we talked about what those are at the beginning of the lecture. So key points to remember here, CO2 levels, that's where all the action is. Okay, normally oxygen, not such a big deal only when it's falling below 60 millimeters mercury. You'd have to have such a big change in this scenario that, that you'd really be in trouble. Um, and so this is usually sensed via the peripheral chemoreceptors. We know that carbon dioxide is sensed by receptors, both those peripheral ones and also receptors in the brain. And then again, third point here, pH is really tied to, to getting rid of carbon dioxide. That's how you make changes in pH within your blood system. And we also saw that despite the fact that you can regulate your pH up or down, that that, that window of regulation is still very narrow. You can't have your pH fluctuating from pH of 4 to pH of 9. Okay, that, That's incompatible with life You're within a very, very narrow range usually. Okay, uh, so respiratory controls by higher brain centers. So um, what we were talking about up to now, this is kind of all the, the, the automatic thing that's going on in the background. Uh, we also know that there's controls that, that we can have over our breathing. 
So, so I can control whether I want to take a breath or not, okay? So this is background thing going on, but I can also have some control over this. Um, and this is a little bit different than the heart, for example. Uh, so like the heart, though, there is these kind of hypothalamic controls as well. Um, and the basic idea is that um, sometimes, so the hy hy hypothalamic controls are originating in the hypothalamus, hypothalamus will send signals down to those respiratory centers, so particularly down through the, uh, um, the ventral and the dorsal respiratory groups. Um, and again, this can, can impact the rate and depth of respiration. Hypothalamic controls are not, that's not voluntary control. This might occur when you, you hold your breath if you gasp in, in anger or pain or something like this. It's not quite the background regulation we just finished talking about, but it's also uh, not something usually you have under, under your own control. That own control, as I call it, this is occurring from kind of these, these higher brain, range, brain regions here, and these are, are the uh, cortical controls. Um, and so this is like holding your breath, for example. And the important thing to note about these cortical controls, and this is different than what I just mentioned with the hypothalamic controls, that this is not going through those respiratory centers in the medulla oblongata. So it's basically taking a detour around here to, to, to really kind of uh, stimulate things right at the diaphragm and those intercostal muscles, okay? Cortical controls are bypassing those medullary controls. Uh, you also have respiration control by reflexes. Um, and so one example is the pulmonary irrit irritant reflex. And so if you get dust in your, in your system, for example, or if you, you have allergies, um, you can have receptors in these areas that will, will uh, communicate with those respiratory centers uh, via uh, what are called vagal nerve afferents, okay? And this will, will uh, control uh, constriction of your air passages, so, so your bronchioles, for example. This is not so much going to, to impact, um, this is not so much gonna impact ventilation, but it might impact uh, external respiration. Again, what is external respiration? External respiration is getting air from the lungs into the bloodstream. Um, and so this is also involved in, in you know, triggering a cough if you get something stuck in your, in your trachea um, or, or a sneeze if you have something caught in your nasal cavity. So both of these things can be referred to as pulmonary irritant reflexes. You also have what's called the initiation reflex, and this is also called the Herring-Bauer reflex. Um, and the basic idea is that you have stretch receptors. What do stretch receptors sense? Well, they sense stretch, specifically within the pleura. So this is, this is the bag which is surrounding your lungs. Um, and so basically these are, are sensed, or so this, these receptors are going to sense a stretching of those lungs. And the basic idea is when they're activated, they're going to send signals up to your brain uh, to those respiratory centers that we've been talking about today and tell them to, to stop signaling, okay? And basically this is involved in, in making sure you don't take too big of a breath, okay? Um, and so the thought is that this might actually be more of a protective response than, than something that's a, a normal regulatory mechanism. So maybe this doesn't come into play too much, but if you start inhaling too much, then you're going to have stretch of your lungs. That's going to send a signal up to your brain telling it, hey, stop trying to inhale. So this is a, a great diagram of the summary of respiratory control. Um, summarizes everything I've just said. Uh, there's one mistake in this diagram uh, that, that I'd like you to make note of. So we talked about how these higher brain centers actually bypass this respiratory region. So as near as I understand, this is actually a mistake. So you could have a hypothalamus signaling through this, this section, but the higher centers are going to bypass this region and act more directly on, uh, on areas of the, of the, uh, the diaphragm and also the, the ex external uh, the, the external intercostal muscles, okay? So higher brain centers bypassing this medullary control. This is the medullary control here, okay? Um, very quickly, uh, there's respiratory adaptations during exercise. And so, you know, as I'm sitting here giving a lecture, I have a certain rate of breathing. During exercise, which is called, called uh, hypernia, 
uh, you can have increased ventilation, and this is important because you have increased metabolic needs. Um, and so the idea here is the you know, muscles need more oxygen. You want to get more air uh, interacting with those alveoli and, and eventually providing oxygen down to those really demanding tissues, such as your leg muscles, arm muscles, whatever. And in this case, case ventilation can increase 10 to 20 fold. Okay, so, so go back to these kind of diagrams that we saw talking about tidal volume versus the other volumes that, that we can talk about when we're inflating and, and deflating the lungs. So uh, what's interesting is that during exercise, you actually have a, a really increase, a re really uh, abrupt increase in, in ventilation very early on. And then after that really abrupt increase, you're going to increase gradually until you reach a steady state. And the reverse is true on the other uh, side as well. You have a, a, a abrupt decline in ventilation followed by a gradual decrease. And so, you know, intuitively you might be familiar with this. If you're jogging um, and you suddenly stop, you know, you'll notice that your breathing rate goes down really, really quickly initially, and then it'll continue to go down at a slower rate until it gets back to normal. Okay. Um, despite this, you have carbon dioxide, oxygen, and pH are remaining surprisingly constant during exercise. And, and this is really because, first of all, you have regulation. Um, and second of all, you have that oxygen is being used up by your muscles. Okay, so, so the, the steady state level in your system doesn't change, despite the fact that you have more flux through the system. You're taking in more oxygen, using more oxygen, um, but uh, it's all coupled to the muscles. So within your bloodstream, the levels don't change that much. And that's important, okay? Because we know that those levels are important for ensuring control uh, of other things like uh, blood pressure, things like this. Um, during exercise, uh, because we have this very quick increase in, uh, in ventilation and a very decrease in ventilation when we stop exercising, it seems that people think that there's additional things that are going on in that scenario, okay? So it's not all about the regulation that we've talked about previously. There might be psychological stimuli, such as the anticipation of exercise, that are important for starting to, to get this very abrupt increase. Um, there might be some link with your skeletal muscles as well. So as your skeletal muscles start to move, that really kicks those respiratory centers into high gear. And also as, uh, well, I guess that's what, what three just said here as well. As those things start to move in both your muscles, tendons, and also joints, you're going to be signaling up to those respiratory centers, probably to the, the VGR and the, uh, and the dorsal group, okay? Um, again, very little change in oxygen or CO2 levels within your system in general because this is coupled to the efficient use or release of those oxygen versus carbon dioxide in those active muscles during exercise. Okay, um, it's just, so that is uh, all of the uh, material that we needed to cover um, for the course. So, so you finished everything. The rest are just these review questions. So again, uh, go through the review questions, uh, make sure you understand the logic behind the answers, uh, and we can take some of these up within the office hours, okay? Um, and also remember that we have a review session that is coming up, um, and um, please let me know what you want me to cover on that review session. It's really important that I hear from you guys to get feedback on what you need more information about, okay? Um, as usual, um, there's... Uh, you know, you can also ask me questions at any time via email, and I'm happy to, to communicate with you about things that you might not understand, okay? Um, so finally, uh, good luck on the exam. I'm, I'm confident that you guys will do really well. I've really enjoyed interacting with you guys, and I'm looking forward to interacting with you in the final review sessions that we have. Again, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.